voice working? Okay. Did a lot of talking last night. I know the mic's working, and my voice is the one that I'm worried about. Uh, thank you for attending. Thank you, Sodom US, for giving me the, the chance to talk today. Um, my name's Kevin Bullock. I'm a product manager at Digital Globe. Um, that's a real image from space. That's not a Photoshop thing. It's uh, The artist is written at the bottom uh, from Belfast, Ireland. It took him a few months to scatter some dirt and earth objects to make that. Uh, we, we shot it from space. So just wanted to make sure everyone knew that this is real and most of what I'll be talking about today is real. With <laughs> most. All right, so normally when I do presentations, I do a big blurb about like, we're Digital Globe, you probably don't know us, here's what we do. But I think this crowd is a little bit of an exception. Um, I think many people are familiar with Digital Globe. Um, or if, if anyone's used the internet in the last six months, you might be familiar with these events. Um, um, I'm not gonna be talking about these events, but I just wanted to show sort of the, the type of work we do. So um, over on the right is uh, Tacloban, Philippines, and before and after shots of Typhoon Haiyan. Um, up at the top, if anyone's heard of the Malaysian airline that still disappeared, no one can find it, we're still looking for it. Um, so uh, Courtney Love was talking about our imagery and Carson Daly, so that kind of took our website down for a while. Um, and then Satellite Sentinel Project, this is George Clooney's uh, initiative, uh, identifying violence and trying to stop violence in the Sudan. Um, if anyone is on the talk listserv, they probably saw this post from Alex. Uh, two days ago, we announced our partnership with Mapbox to open up a large amount of imagery. The technical term is a metric ton of something. Um, of imagery through, through Mapbox available, uh, in this case, ID editor. So uh, we have imagery in every country of the world available here. Not every country is complete. Uh, there's some updates we need to do. Uh, and Mapbox has also uh, announced a update tool where OSM users can go in and request for new imagery updates. So we're really happy uh, that we got this done. Um, I, was at, I was in Birmingham last September, um, and I gave a, a, a lightning talk, and the first question was, when can we start tracing on your imagery? The answer is last Thursday, starting now. So everyone, um, please use our imagery, and please uh, ask me questions, and I'll give you my contact info at the end if you don't understand what we do. Uh, here's an awesome example of what what the result of that is. This is Mamu Guinea. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Uh, this this was in a response to the Ebola crisis uh, recently spearheaded by uh, Kate and the Hot Team. Um, there was no imagery available of this city, so we uh, deployed it um, and 68. Uh, OSMers traced it overnight, basically, 20, 24 hours, 20,000 buildings. We want to do a lot more of this, um, not only in Guinea, not only with HOT, but around the world, uh, for every country in the world. Um, this is what it's all about. So does anyone want to do more of that? Woo! All right, thank you. <laughs> We're going to do it. Um, so our, we have five satellites. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of those later. This is what they did last year. So this is an animation I did January 1st through December 31st. This is what we do every year. We're going to do it again this year. There's a couple little spots we don't quite get to at the end of this GIF. Uh, we're going to fill those in and update everything else. So we are literally mapping the world on an annual basis from space with satellite imagery that's extremely accurate. To give you some stats, uh, 600,000 images, 784 million square kilometers. The land mass of the Earth is about 148 million. So we collect a lot of data, Six, almost 7,000 terabytes, multiple petabytes. That's on an annual basis. It's from this pool of data that we can now pull imagery that's relevant uh, for OpenStreetMap and start doing 
continuing to do amazing work with OSM. Uh, this is our fleet of satellites. These are not microsatellites. Uh, I called them macro satellites last month. I don't know if, if that's a term. I looked it up. The actual term is big satellites. So these are big, <laughs> big satellites. Very, very technical. I had to look that up. Uh, we've been operating Iconos for almost 15 years now, um, and uh, World V2 is was our latest launch a few years ago. Uh, what big satellites mean are very accurate numbers down here on the bottom, and I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Um, this is the highest resolution, most accurate fleet of satellites in the world. That's why they're big. I'll talk. I'll explain that in a bit. The way we talk about our quality is, and by the way, my pet peeve is, oh, that image really sucked. I need something better. Well, what does that mean? What does sucked mean? Or, I, I've seen other, other words in other languages as well. I won't repeat them here. So we talk about our quality using these four terms, uh, completeness that GIF showed you the completeness of the world. Currency, this is not dollars, this is how recent the image is. Uh, consistency and accuracy. So this is my agenda. Um, I'm going to talk about this, going to tell a story, and then tell you all about a developer platform we're launching later this year. Uh, so to give you an example, one of, the, one of the services we've launched this year is a annual update program we call Refresh. So we, we started in the US, we want to grow it beyond the U.S., but what we're doing, we're mapping the entire U.S. wall-to-wall, -wall, all 50 states, all territories on an annual basis with high-resolution imagery. We intend to grow this beyond the U.S., but this is just the type of mapping program we're starting to do uh, with our constellation. Uh, we, we have another s service that we call the Daily Take. What this is, um, and it might be easier if, if you come to our table, I can show you this live. What this is, is every image we took yesterday is processed, orthorectified, uh, ready for consumption, and put online for today. So we took an image of uh, the Blossom Festival, or whatever it's called, down at the Tidal Basin. We can show you that today. So we're publishing a lot of imagery. Um, if you remember those stats, um, we collect about 2 million square kilometers or so a day. Um, I think the state of California is about 400,000 square kilometers, just to give you a rough order of magnitude. And we're publishing about a million square kilometers a day of imagery. The other cool thing we're doing uh, is what we call Vivid. So we crawl through our archive. This is just one example of a project we did recently in South America. And this green, the green areas in that map are where we have coverage. We're crawling through, finding the best imagery, the most cloud-free, the most synoptic making sure every pixel matches with its neighbor, and creating seamless, beautiful base maps. All right, uh, accuracy. Here's our satellite. I, did I mention they were big? Uh, this was Worldview 2 when it was being built up at Ball Aerospace in Boulder. Uh, we have another satellite up there right now um, that's even bigger. Uh, our CTO and founder of the company, his name's Dr. Walter Scott, he was asked a question in November um, by one of our analysts. Well, why is it your satellites are so big? Why aren't you building the small satellites like everyone else? Uh, his answer was pretty epic, so I thought I'd just paraphrase it. Um, if anyone's watched movies or watched uh, by athletes at the Olympics or hunted, uh, when you're targeting something from a long range, you need a big, solid foundation to make sure it's accurate. Uh, he, the analogy, <clears throat> excuse me, the analogy he used was a sniper rifle. Um, there's a reason why sniper rifles are huge. That same reason is the reason why our satellites are huge, uh, because they're extremely accurate and extremely pre precise. Uh, the width of the lens on that telescope is over a meter wide. It's like a huge magnifying glass or a telescope, which allows us to see the Earth from a long ways away. Um, so sniper rifle, that, that the analogy, it's analogous to our satellites. Uh, you don't see s marine snipers carrying uh, PP7 handguns like, like uh, James Bond. There's a reason why, and it's, it's exactly what we do as a company. Okay, so I was happy when Mike from GitHub told a little story, because I'm going to tell a quick little story as well. 
uh, his took place over this weekend. Mine took place 250 years ago. Hope that's cool. Um, so a bunch of British surveyors, after they m finished mapping Great Britain, they wanted to do something more challenging, so they mapped India. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this. Has anyone heard of this? All right, cool. Let, let's talk. Um, this is an amazing story. They thought it would take about five years, team of 10 people. Uh, it took 70 years to do. Um, they lost hundreds of people to disease and wild animals and really bad things. Um, but they mapped the entire uh, country of India and found out their original maps were 10 to 20 miles off um, uh, using, using survey equipment. Uh, they actually were able to measure uh, spherical triangles for the first time, so they're able to verify that the Earth was round um, and confirm Galileo's theory. So if, what this is is just a bunch of triangles. It's called the trigonom trigonometric survey of India, just a bunch of triangles. Uh, pretty simple math, but they were actually able to detect the arc of the Earth. Some, some people call this the, the great arc, because um, they figured out the Earth was round. Yet, somehow, these guys still exist, and I just don't understand that. I, I, I can't figure out if that's real or ironic or a joke, but they're still around. So this, this, this dude's my hero. This is Surveyor General Lambton, who gave the best business case in history. He said, don't worry about the details. No argument is necessary to show the benefits of this survey. And he was right. And he pitched that to the king. The king said, go do it. So he started with a baseline. Um, everything starts with a baseline. Uh, open street map started with a baseline. Um, th back then, they used this chain, which was 100 feet long. So they measured a baseline in Madras, or Chennai, as it's now known. Uh, seven miles long. It took him a few months to measure it. Um, it, it was very difficult because the length of the chain changed with the temperature. So they were measuring accuracy in the thousands of a decimal place. They knew that was important. They spent a lot of time on it. And this is how they did it. They built huge monuments. They put lanterns on top of the monuments and measured them with theodolites, took a bunch of notes, did a lot of work. Here's where the story gets cool, as if it wasn't already. This is where it gets real cool. They got up to Nepal and weren't allowed in Nepal because the Nepalese believed they were coming to take over the country. So Nepal said, stay out, but you can look at our mountains from afar. So this is the actual survey, and you can see the border of Nepal, and you can see all these observation points. This is about 150 miles away where they were making observation. This one right here is a mountain you might be familiar with. Um, we call it Everest. It was named after Sir George Everest was his pronunciation, but no one liked that pronunciation, so they called it Everest. We don't actually know if Everest or Everest actually saw the mountain, because he was based out of Great Britain. So here's the amazing part. This is a, this is a picture taken from India of Mount Everest, um, just to show you how far away they are. They had six observation points. They took 10 years observing this mountain. Bunch of calcula the math calculations were, were two years of that, 10 years. And they averaged it out, and it came out to be 29,000 feet. This was in 1847. They thought that was a ridiculous number. There's no way a mountain is exactly 29,000 feet. There's no way people at home are going to believe them. So they bumped it up to 29,002. <laughs> true, true story. I'd love to know that conver or listen to that conversation. Let's just bump it up. Now, that's a legitimate number. <laughs> Obviously, right? So um, today, using GPS, we know this uh, to be 29,029 feet. The accuracy that they were able to perform back in 1840s using archaic equipment uh, is absolutely phenomenal. The reason I tell this story is because it's an awesome story, but it goes to show you that for hundreds of years now, and I love that OpenStreetMap, we talk about the heritage and the legacy. For hundreds of years now, surveyors, uh, geodesers, geologists, geographers, geospatialists, geomatics, they've always placed an emphasis on accuracy. That's the same I know with OpenStreetMap, and that's the same breed and DNA that's at Digital Globe, a focus on accuracy. Uh, here's just a, this is my slightly unreal slide. This is not to scale. I made this myself. So this is one slide that's not real. This is how our satellites work. Um, they're literally falling in space. That's called an orbit. Um, they go 24,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, they weigh 2,800 kilograms, and they're about 700 
uh, kilometers off the Earth's surface. It's a low Earth orbit. Um, and they're, they uh, revolve around the Earth about 15 times a day, and we talk to them every 10 or 15 minutes. What they're doing uh, in orbit is they're pointing to actually move and target different areas. And we make predictions on where clouds are going to be. And that's why you see clouds in our imagery, because we're not always right, just like weather forecasters. Um, and our accuracy, I've stated it in kilometers, just to give you the magnitude of, of what that means, is about three and a half meters on the, on the ground. And that is without any control points or any horizontal GPS or open street map to control. So what does this look like? This is Logan Circle. Um, Circular error means 90% of the points are going to fall within that circle if I'm targeting that statue in the middle. Uh, this is 100 meter CE90, which is pretty good from space. Um, this is your typical accuracy of a smaller satellite. So there's a lot of room for improvement, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's a whole fleet of satellites in space right now that shoot about 50, 50. Uh, Landsat 8, which is uh, one of my favorite satellites, 12 meter CE90, it's a big satellite. Our fleet of satellites shoots within that target. Uh, this is really important for mapping, as uh, everyone knows. I don't think I need to explain that. This is what happens, this is one CE90 difference. So if I'm targeting that statue, I could be right there. It's kind of a big deal um, and really important. So. This is a good segue to our next satellite, uh, the most accurate and the most high resolution satellite that's ever been built in the commercial industry. Uh, Worldview 3, it's going to launch in August. Um, we have a bunch of multi-spectral bands. Um, we have SWIR, which is shortwave infrared, and we have a bunch of atmospheric bands. And for the first time ever, um, we'll be able to collect 30 centimeter imagery. So that means anywhere in the world, we'll be able to see Moscow or Beijing at 30 centimeters. It's never been done before. Or at least it might have been done and no one lived to tell about it. <laughs> True story. OK, so what is SWIR? Um, shortwave infrared, this is a fire in California. Um, we can actually, so you can see the smoke plume, we can actually penetrate particulates in the atmosphere, um, see right through smoke, and actually see the burning fire footprints of a forest fire. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, that's why I'm going to California on Monday for CalGIS. They're really excited about this. Uh, there's been a drought there. Surface reflectance using uh, other bands. This is what a typical shot from space looks like. It looks really weird. Um, but we do a bunch of things to make it better. You can see clouds. You can see weird colors. So we can actually measure the reflectance off your surface, uh, quantify it, and normalize. Okay. We have initiated a platform. Uh, our sl slogan for it is Geo Big Data, or Geospatial Big Data. Um, this is a platform that's going to be launched this year. Uh, the concept is we have a lot of imagery. Uh, we can automate a bunch of stuff. We can get humans involved. Um, we can get developers involved and do some amazing things. Here's an example. Um, for the life of me, well, let me just state this differently. My dream is that we can start automating building footprints instead of us tagging and making them square. To me, that just seems like a waste of, well, not a waste. To me, that seems like an inefficient use of our time. So what if we just automated it and got 80% of them right, and then we humans come in and clean it up and validate? Um, we think that this can be done. And we've been, we have a, um, an R&D team who's developed algorithms that can do this at scale. Uh, roads are actually easier than buildings, usually, um, so we can do roads. We can do land use based on uh, using multispectral analysis. We can do land classification. So my idea is why don't we provide a metric ton of data for a lot of really smart developers to play with and see if we can automate this um, and improve the velocity of OpenStreetMap. Uh, this is what the architecture looks like. I'm not going to walk through it, but you have a bunch of imagery and algorithms on the left. You have a bunch of storage on EC2 um, and S3 wrapped around, wrapped with an SDK, 
and we have a bunch of smart people that we want to invite to come in and uh, play around with our imagery. When I say a lot of data, this is um, maybe 50 petabytes of data. I don't know. Big number. Um, so if you want more information, there's uh, email. We have a team that are, that are taking initial input. This hasn't been launched yet. It's, it's alive, but we haven't launched it publicly, so it's coming. You'll hear more about it from us later in the year. So with that, um, are there any questions? Yes. Great, great presentation. Can you talk more about why digital flow is using this data? Okay, so the question is why are we doing this? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm more than, I know I didn't answer everyone's questions today, limited time, but we're, we have a table out there. Um, we have toys to give away, so. Um, the question, the, so the answer is um, OpenStreetMap has actually been using our imagery for a long time now, whether um, it's through the State Department, HIU, Josh is in here somewhere, whether it's through Bing Maps, that's our imagery. So we wanted to sort of cut, um, I'll use the example of Bing. So we're relying on Microsoft or Bing who may or may not even know that their imagery is being traced. We want to be more direct um, and I don't want to say cut out the middle person, but I'll say cut out the middle person. So we can engage and understand the use cases, understand the problems, and be able to better serve the community. Um, OpenStreetMap is important for Digital Globe. A lot of our end users who are in the field and remote are using it. So it's really important for them and us that there's cohesion and conflation with OpenStreetMap and our imagery. So you put, if you remember that map of the world with all our imagery, overlay that with OpenStreetMap and it's a really powerful tool for our end users, our customers, our entire ecosystem. I think I have a few more minutes. Uh, you're talking about automated feature extraction um, to support the OpenStreetMap database. What about the mass upload of putting all that in the database, you know, the topology and other kind of human identifying layers? Or, okay. Or, you know, so identifying features beyond structures and roads out of imagery and what about uploading those into the database without messing up what's already in there. Oh yeah. Um, that's exactly what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> well we're not gonna be able to cover it in thirty seconds, so okay. Anything else? Yep. Tough to tell from your animated GIF um, how far out it goes in terms of looking at ocean cover. Yeah. So we look at a lot of ocean, a lot of, uh, yes, so you, you said depth or going out. Um, the answer is both. Um, we look at a lot of ocean and we actually do a lot of seafloor sea floor mapping. With the eight multispectral bands, we can actually penetrate um, the surface of the ocean and see to about um, 100 meters deep if the water's calm. So we can do benthic mapping, seafloor classification. We have a partner in Munich, uh, the company's called EO Map, um, who does this full time. So he's doing amazing things with our imagery, uh, monitoring um, seafloor habitat, monitoring coral. We can do that with our satellites. Is that answer? <laughs> Alyssa. Why were they measuring non Everest in Um I don't know if they were measuring in feet or meters. Um, they use miles in in Great Britain, so I don't I don't know. I don't know if they actually were measuring in feet or we, we translate it. Yeah, I'm I'm from Canada, so I'm pro metric system, <laughs> as the rest of the world is apparently. Um, so I usually like do it in my head, but good question. A couple more. Uh, I see that y'all do a lot of mapping of Earth. Um, do you do any other mapping, like, of the moon or... Uh, mapping aliens, uh, UFOs? No, so 
Yeah, that's a really awesome question. The uh, question is, are we only mapping this planet or other planets? Uh, today it's only the Earth. Um, our satellites are extremely maneuverable, so we actually have taken pictures of the moon. Um, but it's kind of um, it's kind of risky to do that. Uh, but primarily, I mean, 99.99 percent is of planet Earth. Um, occasionally, we'll look out into space. Hubble's better at that than we are. Oh, way in the back. For disaster applications, the pre and the post are often the most important things we can get. Will this support that use case? Uh, the, so the question is, will this, um, will this use case of pre and post event imagery be supported? Uh, pre event, yes. Um, post event is the hard part, as we've seen in every disaster in response. Uh, I was just actually talking to Josh about this, um, and Kate is going to come to Colorado and talk about it with us. But post event is, um, yes, it should. But post-event is tough because it's a big coordination. Everyone knows this. We have to get the right shot to the right people. Um, but in theory, this would support it, as long as we get the shot. Now, I can't guarantee every disaster we're going to get the shot, uh, but we have a pretty damn good chance of doing it. No, we publish everything. Um, our, our lice, so the question is, do we publish photos of military and sensitive areas? We uh, are licensed by the U.S. government, by NOAA. Um, there's one piece of legislation called the Kyle Bingham legislation, which makes us resample our imagery to two meters over Israel. NOAA also has us resample our imagery 50 centimeters globally right now. Um, that may change. Other than that, there's no restriction. So you can go see Area 51 in our archive. You can go see um, any part of the world from our archive. Other than cloud coverage, how do you determine what uh, order you're going to be taking pictures of? And roughly, how frequently, you know, over, say, an urban area, would you get uh, refreshing? Uh, we can look at any place on Earth on a daily basis. So if it's important enough, we can do that. We did that in the Philippines. Um, we have a scoring algorithm that looks at, as a satellite passes over, there's thousands of targets it could, it could acquire. So we have a scoring algorithm that says, which is the most important target? How many people are asking for that, uh, that particular shot? What's the cloud cover look like? What's the angle we're going to have to use to collect that? So it's a like scoring thing, and then we just score the highest priority and collect them. Um, but with five satellites and soon to be six, um, they're all working harmoniously, and they all talk to each other. They're working collectively as a group, kind of like open street mappers are, to map the world. Okay, I think, um, I think I'm going to get yanked off in one minute. So last question, I think. Do you keep on all your imagery forever? Most of it forever, yes. Um, the only thing we've purged is like images that are 100% clouds and we think are probably not going to be useful. I think we put them on tape and um, put them in a mountain somewhere. But through our archive and our website, uh, everything that's what would we consider useful and interesting is there. That goes back to 1998 or 1999. So uh, thank you very much. I'll be out there at the table uh, if you want to talk. Thank you.